Growing up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, I didn't like what I saw. And we had to change that. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. He fought until the very end. That was my big brother. John Lewis's legacy will be that he transformed America and made it a better place. He said to all of the young people, you must get out there and push and pull and make America what America should be. I needed to come out and show how much we loved him and how much he'll be missed. Generations from now, when parents teach their children what is meant by courage, the story of John Lewis will come to mind. You too can help change our country. You can help change the world. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Aisha Howard. Tonight, we look back at the life and career of a civil rights icon, American hero, John Lewis. Since word of Lewis's death, the location of this mural on Auburn Avenue has really turned into a makeshift memorial to honor his legacy. Many have come to find comfort at his towering image. Some never met him, while others knew him well. He was such a powerful man. Um, and just hearing that he had passed, it was kind of devastating, but I was so happy that my kids got a chance to meet him. They kind of knew what he stood for. And like she said, because she is graduating and she is our future. I had the rare privilege of watching one of the transformative figures of the 20th century help to change America. He, he bent the arc of history, and that's so rare that someone could give his life for a struggle. Um, I believe that when history is written, it will record John Lewis with Mandela and King and Gandhi as one of the, the great transformative figures of the 20th century. Congressman Lewis's legacy is one of inspiration and leadership, and it's that leadership that is needed more today than ever before. Hope Ford talked to two young leaders and activists willing to pick up the torch and continuing to make good trouble. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Congressman Lewis once said Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. helped shape him. But from age 15 on, Lewis would use his actions and his words to inspire, influence, and guide others. He's someone that, since I was a little girl, I just have always looked up to him. Hannah Gebra Selassie is one of many activists continuing to lead protests in Atlanta. If it were not for them, I would not be here today. Many of us would not be here today. Um, you know, they fought so that we could exist. And as the memorial grows below civil rights leaders of the past, current president of the Georgia NAACP, Reverend James Woodall, remembers celebrating the icon's 80th birthday in February. He just simply walked around the room and he danced with a few people and, you know, he just had nothing but joy on his face and, and love in his heart. And that's really the man he was. He just simply was a humble servant. Lewis's pursuit of justice left a playbook for young leaders like 26-year-old Woodall. To stand up, to speak out, and to show up and show out in ways that we knew to be necessary. Lewis's death in this moment and during this movement is a mix of heartbreak and motivation. We do mourn, but we also recommit to doing justice, to loving mercy, to walking humbly, and to doing it in a way that lifts up all people. We know the words and we know them well. And young justice advocates say they'll honor Lewis by continuing to make good trouble. They brought us here, and now it's time for us to take it even further. Thank you, Representative John Lewis, thank you. 120 days ago, five Atlanta men, five legends of the American 20th century, warriors in the fight for civil and human rights, recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom were with us. Now three are gone, two within the span of 12 hours. Ambassador Andrew Young and Hank Aaron remain. Atlanta without Congressman John Lewis, the Reverend C.T. Vivian and Dr. Lowry, difficult to fathom. They cast giant shadows on so much here for so long. Four decades ago when I first arrived in Atlanta, a college friend from the Rocky Mountain West asked me, do you ever see any of these civil rights leaders in the community? Ever, ever encounter any? I responded, oh yeah, all the time. I see them in grocery stores, cafeterias, ball games. Charity events, they're involved everything in Atlanta, large and small. I've met all of them. While many big cities are defined by architecture, bridges, skyscrapers, natural beauty and location, Atlanta is unique. Our city has been known for its leadership, its moral leadership, men and women who changed not only this city, 
but the country and the world. In 2008, when Morris Brown College was on the brink of being shuttered, and the city of Atlanta had shut off the water, it was the Reverend C.T. Vivian who mobilized and helped raise a half million dollars for the historic school founded by slaves, including getting the water turned back on. Today, Morris Brown College is prospering with new construction and a bustling enrollment. Reverend Vivian's workshops on race have trained thousands of Atlanta's leaders, both black and white, over the last 45 years. Dr. Joseph Lowry served Atlanta as the pastor of Cascade United Methodist Church from 1986 through 1992. The congregation is one of Atlanta's most influential churches. When my Atlanta colleagues would gather at work in restaurants and dinner parties or attend civic events, invariably the subject would come up. What does Atlanta look like without these great lions of the movement? Sadly, it means losing our soul. We should all be grateful for their navigation of the ship through difficult generational storms. Atlanta has survived and prospered, but what now? Where are we going? We are about to find out. Dr. King said, whatever your life's work is, do it well. A man should do his job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn could do it no better. When we come back, a special look back at a busy day in the life of the Congressman on Capitol Hill. In 2011, 11 Alive produced an award-winning documentary hosted by Brenda Wood called Letters to Our Children. The show celebrated Congressman Lewis being awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama. Instead of reporters asking the questions, the honor went to their children. As you are about to see, Lewis's responses showed both his compassion, but also his hope in a future generation. John Lewis, the, the, the dude is fierce. Fierce, courageous, and determined. I saw this wonderful, innocent, saintly young man who was uh, committed to changing the South without violence. They were in a war and they were the frontline soldiers in that war. They were going in the battle to overcome evil with love, to overcome violence with nonviolence. Literally stood on the front lines uh, for freedom uh, and created real change and helped uh, the United States uh, live up uh, to its constitution. Some consider him fierce, courageous, and determined. Some consider him almost saintly. He is a giant in the civil rights movement, and yet some say he's an ordinary person doing extraordinary things. He was devoted to the cause of nonviolence. John Lewis has touched the lives of many people. And now my colleagues and I share his story in a very special way as we pen letters to our own children. To my dynamic daughters, my heart bursts with pride at the young ladies you are today and the young women you will become. It may be hard for you to believe, but things you do without a second thought were still taboo even 50 years ago. I know we have spent many hours talking about the civil rights movement and its importance to African American history. I was a kid back in the 60s and I watched the civil rights movement through the eyes of a child even younger than you are now. The longevity of the freedoms afforded us are in direct proportion to our willingness not to give up, not to give out, and not to give in. That's the mantra by which Congressman John Lewis has lived. One of the true trailblazers was instrumental in organizing student sit-ins with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. He also organized bus boycotts and several nonviolent protests with Dr. King. He is the only person still living who spoke on the program on August 23rd, 1963, during the historic March on Washington, in which Dr. King gave this famous I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream speech. He also led over 600 marchers across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, which became known as Bloody Sunday because while praying, they were attacked and beaten. 
freedoms our ancestors fought and died for cannot be wasted. So Candace, I urge you, don't forget the sacrifices made that got you where you are right now. We can thank people like John Lewis for leaving the footsteps that the world can follow. Just going to show my face so I won't be in trouble. Oh, How long ago did they call? Oh. Good to see you, brother. Hi. You know, you know, Brendan. The pace of his days on Capitol Hill. In one evening, I went to like seven reception. Gives no hint of his 70 years. Oh, go, go, no, go ahead. Oh, you're going up, I'm going down. Welcome. Congressman John Lewis started this day at 7 a.m. At the debate for Ways and Means. Today, the House will vote on health care. Oh, Ways and Means. And between committee meetings and his scheduled late afternoon speech on the House floor, the repeal before senior to pay. Wherever he goes, he's greeted with hero status. How are you, How are you doing? By Democrats. From We're with the UAW. Chicago. And Republicans. This morning. Yes. How are you doing? Mm -hmm and plain ordinary people. You are a hero of this nation. John Lewis is a living legend, one of the architects of a desegregated America, alongside Dr. Martin Luther King, whom he wishes could still give him guidance. Even sometimes when I'm sitting on the floor of the house, uh, maybe I'm going to speak, maybe I'm going to say something, I say to myself, I wonder what would Dr. King do? I wonder what would Dr. King say? Private thoughts about the great man who changed Lewis's life and put him, too, on the path of greatness. I have been hurt, so I had a patch on my head. President Obama will honor John Lewis with the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor a president can give. It is a great honor. He was told a few months ago. And I said, Mr. President, you need to stop. You keep on talking, you're going to make me cry. And he sort of said, go ahead and cry. And you did? I did. Recognition of his work conducted in the streets of Nashville and Montgomery, Birmingham and Selma back in the 60s. Work with Dr. King that paved the way for such an honor to be bestowed by the nation's first black president. Have you thought about uh, what you'll say? I will be accepting it on behalf of not just myself, but countless individuals that have stood in those unmovable lines in Selma trying to register to vote. For those who sat at lunch counters and went on freedom rides 50 years ago, and for those beaten, even murdered, for the sake of equality. It says something about the distance that I've come. It says something about a power greater than himself and a destiny he had to live. From the Jim Crow days of Troy, Alabama, to the halls of Congress, to the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Congressman John Lewis's life journey is nothing short of a purposed miracle. We're going to walk together. When I heard the words of Dr. King on old radio, seemed like he was saying, you too, John Lewis, can do something. And he started a journey not for the faint of heart. Does it ever cross your mind, wow, how did I have the nerve? Well, every so often, uh, it sort of said, why, how did you sit on those lunch kind of stool and let someone spit on you? or put a lighted cigarette out in your hair. How do you stay there and let someone pull you off of the stool and beat you? Um, but that's about the grace of God. It wasn't until he got arrested that his mother finally learned he'd joined the Civil Rights Movement. So she wrote me a letter, and my middle name is Robert. She said, Dear Robert, you went off to school to get an education. You need to get out of this mess before you get hurt. He didn't listen. Leading a march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma proved a mother's intuition true. I have a scar right here, and one in the top of my head. If you feel right there, just a oh, little yes. dent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lewis never imagined violence that day. He just thought he'd be carted off to jail. I was wearing a backpack. And in this backpack, I had two books, an apple, an orange, toothpaste, and toothbrush. This is the first meeting to plan the march on Washington. This is the so-called Big Six. On the left, a 23-year-old John Lewis, who would be the youngest speaker on one of the nation's most historic days. He still remembers his speech. So you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. 
We cannot wait. We cannot be patient. We want our freedom and we want it now. Of the big six leaders of the civil rights movement, John Lewis is considered the most courageous the movement has ever produced. He's also the only one of the six still living. You never know where what I call the spirit of history is going to lead you. A lot of time we come out here. The man who so defiantly challenged the nation years ago is now part of this nation's establishment with a reminder every day just outside his office window. I, I understand that you really love poetry. Well, I love, yeah, I love poetry. I love music. A humble man I, uh, whose work helped change a nation. Favorite music? Kind uh, of music? Gospel. I love gospel music. A national treasure still in the fight for justice and equality. Favorite song, favorite artist? Well, one of my favorite songs is a uh, gospel song, is Order My Steps. Order my steps. Perhaps because it seems something beyond himself has indeed ordered his steps. What memory of your life would you want to relive? Maybe, just maybe, when we were walking between Selma and Montgomery with Dr. King. The sun was shining and we were just walking, talking. And every now and then someone would sing a song. It was like a holy march, I feel like. God Almighty was walking with us. Thank you. I'm kind of excited, kind of nervous, because I'm meeting somebody that was very, that's really important. You have an opportunity most children can only dream about. It's amazing. This is this is the church where Dr. King actually preached. Well, we're getting ready to talk to Congressman Lewis. As you sit face to face with this living legend, I pray that you appreciate what he did to make today possible for all of us. I'm kind of excited, kind of nervous because I'm meeting somebody that was very that's really important, and I'm looking forward to meeting him today. Today, you will have a rare opportunity to meet this giant who at times risked his own life for so many. I pray his words will inspire and motivate you to continue in the spirit of selflessness to better your community and make a difference in the world. I've heard very little about him. The stories of the struggle will be held as sacred as a family heirloom, and that's why I share them with you now. I've been waiting for this a long time. Thank you. Sometimes I think we take the civil rights movement of old for granted, but it didn't just happen. The future holds endless potential for each of you, thanks to men like Congressman Lewis. Don't ever forget the shoulders on which you stand. How you doing? Fine, good to see you. Good to meet you. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? One day, many years from now, you will say with great pride, I met Congressman John Lewis. And you will say it the same way you would say, I met the President. Hi, how you doing? Good. I hope you never forget the sacrifices made so that you don't experience the hatred and the racism that nearly claimed his life and the lives of so many others. I think it's important to, to tell the stories and to tell the stories over and over again. It's important for our children to know the distance, the progress we've made. What was it like for you when, like when you were my age, I'm 16, what was it like for you going through the segregation and all that stuff that you did with Andrew? I grew up in rural Alabama when I was 16. I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white waiting, colored waiting. As a young child, I was bused long distance uh, to get to an all blank school. I never attended an integrated school or desegregated school. It was all, all black. So I would ask my mother, ask my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why segregation, why racial discrimination? And they was almost like, boy, don't be asking questions like that. Don't you get in trouble. Don't you get in the way. But Dr. King and Rosa Parks and others inspired me to get in trouble, to get in the way. And I've been getting in the way and getting in trouble ever since. <laughs> At the age of 16, with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we went down to the public library in a little town of Troy, Alabama, trying to get library cards, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian, 
that the library was for whites only and not for colors. Tell me, when you look at this picture, how do you feel? When, when I look at that picture, I, I feel like we're standing at, uh, at a point uh, of no return. We could not turn back. because We had been planted there by some force, maybe by history itself, but we couldn't turn back. We had to do it. Because people in, in Selma, Alabama, in other parts of the state, other parts of the American South, could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. When we were marching from Selma to Montgomery and we crossed the bridge, I was walking beside a young man by the name of Jose Williams. And as we walked to the highest point on that bridge, down below we saw a sea of blue Alabama State Troopers. And we kept walking. We came within a hearing distance of the state troopers. And a man said, this is an unlawful march. You have to disperse your orders to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. And Jose said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, troopers, advance. They start pushing us and beating us. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a knife stick and was knocked down and left unconscious. All these years later, I don't recall, I made it back across that bridge, through the streets of Selma, back to that little church. But I do recall being back at the church. I think someone probably literally carried me back to the church. And they asked me to say something to the audience. There were more than 2,000 people on our side trying to get in. The church was full. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam, but can I send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desire to register to vote? The next thing I knew, I'd been admitted to a local hospital in Selma. Were you ever afraid of of what was ahead? No, I, I was never afraid because we are trained to not be afraid and to move on in spite of what could happen to any one of us. I knew when I was sitting in or going on a freedom ride that I could be beaten, I could be killed, but I felt, and I think we all felt, that our cause was so right and so necessary that we have to move on in spite of it all. How hard was it for you guys to uphold that nonviolence thing? Because I know if it was me, personally, I probably wouldn't have been uh, into that nonviolence thing. Well, How if, hard was that? Well, if you had studied uh, the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence, we had role playing, we had social drama, we studied. We prepared ourselves before going on a sit-in, before participating in a march. We, we became disciplined. We became believers in the philosophy of nonviolence. And when someone would spit on us, or pour hot water, hot coffee, or hot chocolate on us, or maybe try to put a cigarette out in our hair or down our back, we tried to take it. And uh, we didn't strike back. So, uh, that's what Gandhi taught us. Because uh, we studied Gandhi, we studied what he attempted to do in South Africa, what he accomplished in India. Uh, we studied what Dr. King was doing in Montgomery. So many of us grew to accept nonviolence, not simply as a technique or as a tactic, but as a way of life, as a way of living. You're a very brave man. Well, I'm not sure whether I was brave or not. I just tried to do what I thought was right and uh, try to be part of an effort to make our country different and make it possible for all of our citizens to become registered voters. May I have a hug? Yes, yes, only. Thank you so much.
what would you charge my generation to do as we go forward? What would you charge my generation to do as we go forward? I think it's important uh, for your generation and for all of us to do our part to try to encourage and get people to become participants in the democratic process. In another time, not that many years ago, people were asked things like, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? How many jelly beans in a jar? People are not going to be asked that today. People won't be beaten in, in jail for participating. So we got to continue to get people to participate. Uh, every vote will count and must count. Bullying is a big problem right now in schools today. What do you think kids should do to stop the bullying unviolently? Bullying is a big problem. It's a major problem. We got to teach all young people the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. Dr. King said on one occasion that we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish as fools. Most of my school is predominantly white students. I think we have a pretty good cultural mix in there. What is that like for you to see that today? When I was growing up, I didn't see that. I, I wanted to attend a little college when I graduated from high school, only 10 miles from my home, called Troy State College then. It's known as Troy University now. It didn't admit me because I was black. I go back to the same school now to speak uh, to the black and white students there. And they gave me an honorary degree. So I tell the students at Troy University, I got my education the easy way from <laughs> Troy University. <laughs> That's funny. When I, I see and, and visit uh, integrated school, uh, it is very moving to me because it said that we'll come a distance. We made a lot of progress. I wish Dr. King was still here to see it, that his dream is becoming real. Sometimes I cry tears of joy and happiness uh, to know the distance we've come, the progress that we've made. I feel more than lucky, I feel very blessed. Dear Congressman Lewis, it was such an honor to meet you in person. I was also glad that we had a chance as teens to talk to you on issues about racism, bullying, and all types of discrimination. I'll never forget the time he gave me a hug and we walked together to the tomb of Martin Luther King Jr. and his wife, Clara Scott King. Meeting with you has been a life-changing experience. You have given me so much perspective on the struggles that you had to endure, as well as the other civil rights leaders. One thing that stood out to me was the fact that everyone in the nonviolent civil rights movement was trained to be nonviolent and actually succeeded in not retaliating. You are an amazing man. You are definitely one of the strongest people I know. Without you, my life would have been totally different. Respectfully, Tyler. Meeting Congressman Lewis definitely had a profound impact on those young lives. So where are they now? Nine years later, Paris Whitney is now a sophomore studying English at Georgia State University on an academic scholarship, I should add. Tyler Johnson is a senior in the Grady School of Journalism at the University of Georgia. His brother Kyle is a graduate of Wake Forest University. He is currently Senior Marketing Coordinator at Cats Networks. Chesley McNeil Jr. is a graduate of Valdosta State University. He's a Systems Manager at Coca-Cola Bottling Company. And Nicole Fuller is a Doctor of physical therapy in Marietta, working with patients with neurological injuries. Up next, John Lewis in his own words as he reflects on one of the most turbulent years in our nation's history. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to 
want to be free now. John Lewis delivered his speech at the March on Washington in August of 1963. There were quite a few more monumental moments to occur that year. Some would bring the nation and the world to its knees. In his own words, Congressman Lewis describes his role in those key moments that shaped the civil rights movement. 1963 was a very unbelievable, disturbing year. There was so much discontent all over America. Governor Wallace had been inaugurated as the governor of Alabama. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. When I saw what was happening in Birmingham, it was un unreal, unbelievable. I never thought that it could happen any place in America, that you can see fire hoses really picking up young people, including children, and dropping them. And the fire hoses was strong enough to put, take bark off of trees, or seeing young children being chased by police dogs. America, America weapon shame. People could, couldn't take it. I remember the morning of the bombing of the church. I was home visiting my relatives in Alabama. And I got a call from the office here in Atlanta saying go to Birmingham. And I made it to Birmingham and my friend Julian Bond, who was the communication director for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, met me there. And the two of us stood across the street from the church, not saying a word to each other, just standing there, almost in a prayerful mood. And it was a sad and dark hour, September 1963. It would be fair to say, because of what happened in Birmingham, it was a greater commitment, a greater sense of dedication a greater sense of stick to itness that we have to do it. We cannot allow the death of these four little girls be in vain. In November, President Kennedy is assassinated. And I feel like during that period, something died in all of us. I was stunned, I was shocked. No, I met him twice. I saw him from a distance when he was campaigning. I admired him. I loved him. Uh, for a long while after the assassination, uh, I collected uh, Kennedy half dollars. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries for equality that no city or state our legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. He inspired me. He inspired me. Uh, he would listen. Um, he was a sympathetic referee in the struggle for civil rights. The Honorable John Lewis is a giant, not only in Atlanta, but his legacy is known all around the globe. He put himself and his life on the front lines time and time again, leading the way with a vision of a better world. The congressman's lifetime dedication inspired the Board of Governors of 11 Alive to bestow him our highest award. Here is a portion of our Community Service Awards from 2015 that paid tribute to the ultimate foot soldier for change. One day. When the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, 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 glory. 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 Oh, glory. 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 Hands to the heavens, no man, no weapon. Formed against, yes, glory is destined. Everyday women and men become legends. Sins that go against our skin become blessings. The movement is a rhythm to us. Freedom is like religion to us. 
justice is just a position in us. Justice for all just ain't specific enough. Once sundown, his spirit is for living in us. True and living, living in us. Resistance is us. That's why Rosa sat on the bus. That's why we walked through Ferguson with our hands up. When One it goes day. down, we women and man up. They say stay down, and we stand up. Shots be on the ground, the camera panned up. King pointed to the mountaintop, and we ran up. One day, glory comes, it will be ours, it will be ours. Oh, oh, oh. one day, when the war is won, we will be sure. Under a bald eagle. The biggest weapon is to stay peaceful. We sing our music is the that we bleed through. Summer in the dream we had an epiphany. Now we right the wrongs in history. No one can win the war individually. Takes the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. The coming of the Lord. My eyes have seen the glory. One day when the glory comes. It will be ours, it will be ours, oh, 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 one day, when the war is won, we will be sure, we will be sure, oh, oh, oh. This is too much. Too much. Just too much. I'm supposed to be strong. Can stand up and fight and in a nonviolent fashion. Supposed to be brave and courageous. But you're making me cry. <laughs> and I had an executive session with myself earlier. I said, I'm not gonna cry. And then you come here and sing glory. Oh glory. I'm going to cry. <laughs> this is too much. Thank you. Thank you. The only, only thing I try to do is to help out. I'm not worthy to be honored to receiving 
an award uh, with all these other unbelievable gifted souls is too much. Growing up in rural Alabama as a young child, I didn't like segregation and racial discrimination. I didn't like the signs that said white only, colored only. And I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But the individuals like Rosa Parks, 15 years old when I heard of her. The words and leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. So I got in the way. I got in trouble. You know, I just went out there and pushed and pulled. And that's what I try to do every day. Just try to help someone. Try to make things a little bit better. My last arrest, and you saw it on the video, eight other members of Congress and 200 citizens, we just went out and said we want the speaker to bring up a comprehensive immigration bill for we felt it doesn't make sense in our country to have more than 12 million people living in the shadow. That's not right, it's not fair, and it's not just. We have to do something about it. We all come from some other place. The late A. Philip Randolph used to say from time to time, who was the dean of black leadership during the march on Washington, maybe our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So it doesn't matter whether we're African American or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We are one people. We are one family. We all live in the same house. Not just the American house, but the world house. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put it another way. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters. We will perish as fools. Each of us must do what we can to leave this little piece of real estate, this little planet, this little spaceship, a little cleaner and a little greener and a little more peaceful for generation yet unborn. 11 alive, thank you. I didn't know you could make me cry, but you did. Thank you. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this year, 2020. And now, John Lewis. How do you memorialize this giant of a man and do it justice? I don't know. I do know one thing, though. We didn't deserve him. The raw, unvarnished, unadulterated young man from Troy, Alabama. We didn't deserve him. A passionate, morally righteous man who got into trouble despite his mother's warning but who understood the difference between bad trouble and good trouble. No, we didn't deserve him, but Lord, did we need him. From the angry 23-year-old who spoke at the March on Washington to the moral compass and conscience of Congress, John Lewis from the very start was always fiery and always fiercely committed to moving America to live out its ideals, come hell or high water, because America seemed not to be able to do it on its own. Even 50 years after King's death, John Lewis was still on the battlefield for justice. Just a month ago, in the Black Lives Matter protest, he was right there in the thick of it as he battled for his own life. Undaunted, unintimidated, even his frailty, he fought. For you, for me, for all of us. The downtrodden, the hurt, the marginalized, the woke, always counted on John Lewis in the fight for right because they knew the powerful would listen. His work had earned that kind of reverence. And blessed, he saw many fruits of his legacy. But in these last few years, he also began to see the clock turning back. And it's likely that God said, no worries, son, my good and faithful servant. You alone have done the work of mighty men. 
You have seen much progress. No need to see any more ugly. Time now to rest. John Lewis was never boastful, never arrogant. After all, he is one of the greatest heroes of our time. Yet he was the most giving, the most humble man you could ever meet. I invited John Lewis to my mother's 80th birthday party many years ago because they had previously connected over their love of the Braves. I never expected him to actually show up, but he did. That's the kind of man he was. And many of you have similar stories, which is why we're seeing countless pictures all over social media of him with just regular folk, because he never saw himself as anything more than regular folk. Only difference, John Lewis allowed himself to be used and moved by the hand of God in the face of violence and pure evil, and he did it without question and without fear. John Lewis was a good man, a gentle man, a magnificent soul, a shining light on a hill. Lord knows we still need him, maybe more now than ever. He's left us with much work still to be done. But God has spoken, challenging us now to have faith in this new generation of freedom fighters. And I believe they will see to it that we finally deserve this visionary, impatient, sacrificial lamb in the body of a raw, restless, and remarkable John Lewis.